Welcome, Council President Nuria Martinez, and I am honored to be here to welcome you to the start of our city's LGBT Pride Month celebrations. For the last 50 years, we have celebrated the LGBTQIA community in Los Angeles with events, parades, and advocacy during Pride Month. Although last year's festivities looked very different from our usual large parties and gatherings, we still celebrated and advocated virtually. When I think of Pride, I think of connections, community, and celebration. Pride events foster new friendships and connections and opens the door to important conversations. Pride Month is also an important reflection point. Looking back at the progress Los Angeles has made since 1970s, I am proud to be an Angelino. As council president, I've worked hard to raise the voices of marginalized members of my community and ensure that we are creating equitable and inclusive policies for the city so that everyone feels safe and welcome in Los Angeles. But while there has been a lot of progress over the past two decades with marriage legalization and adoption, there's still a long way to go. It is an honor to work alongside UFCW Local 770, UFCW's outreach, a group that supports the advocacy work of their members in pursuit of social and economic justice for all, regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Inclusivity in our workplaces is so important, and everyone should feel welcome in all industries. Together, we believe in creating workspaces that cherish diversity, encourage openness, and oppose discrimination. UFCW Outreach and I share a mission to ensure equality, education, understanding, and solidarity throughout our community. Let's take this mission with us into Pride Month and beyond and work towards a more inclusive Los Angeles together. Thank you for having me and I wish you a happy Pride. Thank you, Nuri. Uh, my fierce ally and my sister and our city council president. Hello, Los Angeles, and happy Pride. It has been a long journey to get to where we are today, back to celebrating LGBTQ plus Pride. Although the work continues to get our most vulnerable citizens vaccinated, we have our sights set on the not too distant future when we can finally safely gather en masse with our loved ones and chosen families. I join Mayor Garcetti, Controller Galperin, City Attorney Fewer, Council President Martinez, Council Member Bonin, and the entire City Council in declaring this the official kickoff to Pride Month in Los Angeles. Last June, at the beginning of the COVID-19 summer surge, I shared my State of Pride address. We reflected on how the LGBTQ plus communities have been resilient throughout our history and how that strengthened us for the unknowable future. To keep the spirit of pride alive, my team and I created a virtual pride flag exhibit. And I have to give a shout out to Dave Cano and William Ayala for really being the brains behind this incredible exhibit and working with our friends to make it happen spotlighting the various pride flags that reflect gender identities, sexual orientation, and common interests in the queer communities. I also hosted a virtual exhibit called Pride and Pandemic, Essays on Surviving AIDS and COVID-19, a forum for the queer community to share their perspectives on persevering through the early days of the AIDS crises in the 1980s and how it related to the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, we're honoring frontline activists, the individuals and organizations who have not only been leaders during the pandemic, but who also stand against injustice, bigotry, and indifference. They've put their safety on the line to ensure we had food on our tables and were kept healthy. As many of us look back at the pandemic, we especially remember the selflessness of grocery and retail workers and the importance of our healthcare professionals. That is why it gives me great pride to introduce the first of three LGBT Heritage Month honorees, Outreach at UFCW Local 770. Outreach is the LGBTQ constituency group at UFCW International who advocate within their union and the broader community 
for full equality for LGBTQ plus workers on the job. Their outstanding work made sure that while their members took care of all Angelinos during the pandemic, their employees were also looked after. The United Food and Commercial Workers International Union, UFCW, is a labor union made of 1.3 million hardworking employees in the United States and Canada. They represent workers in grocery, meat packing, cannabis, retail drug stores, and health care. These brave and courageous individuals have faced tremendous stress and trauma, but have shown inspiring resilience and grit. These workers have been on the front lines keeping the city running. Whether it's in a grocery store, a meat packing plant, or giving out vaccines to the community, all during the COVID-19 pandemic. For those reasons and many, many more, in March of 2021, the council adopted the Hero Pay Ordinance, an initiative I enacted with Council President Nuri Martinez with the support of our colleagues, which required grocery store workers to receive a $5 per hour bump. I partnered with UFCW Local 770 to push this policy through City Hall so that we could help our essential workers who keep our families fed. The fact is, UFCW is full of heroes, cashiers, stalkers, uh, baggers, pharmacists, and all other grocery workers that come to work day in and day out. Now, more than ever, when corporations such as Kroger and others are making record-breaking profits, we as a community must protect those that sacrifice for us. Today, we have the honor and privilege of being joined in the studio by Jean Tong, union representative of UFCW Local 770 and several members of Outreach at their Worker Center. Welcome, Jean. Now, first off, how are you doing today? Ah, <laughs> <sighs> well, thanks so much first for having us here. Um, me here in studio and also some of our outreach members in our uh, Huntington Park Worker Center, but also many of our members who are um, watching this from home or wherever they are. Um, it's been a struggle, I ain't gonna lie, mm -hmm. but I feel super grounded to be here today. Um, in fact, today is the first time that our group outreach has a chance, thanks to the rollout of the vaccine, to gather together at the Worker Center to have our outreach meeting for the first time in person since the pandemic started. Amazing. So tell us about how this chapter of outreach started and how it helps serve other members. Yeah, so we started outreach and a major shout out to the leaders and and our leadership, like John Grant, our president in UFCW Local 770, and Michelle Kassler, um, outreach chair at the international level, of having the vision and the courage um, to create this constituency group. Um, we represent 30,000 workers, like you said, in cannabis, retail grocery store, drugstore, Kaiser. Um, and the first time when we decided to start outreach, our committee got together and decided that it's very important that we stay visible to our members. And so we signed up that year for every pride in our jurisdiction, from San Luis Obispo all the way down to Los Angeles County. I think we attended 13 pride that year. Some of the prides were like LA pride, like a you know, parade. Other prides were more like the original pride, like Stonewall, where we marched and protested. Um, and there were other tabling events. Um, and at the time, our president, Ricardo Icasa, and our president now, John Grant, sent an email to the entire staff and 30,000 of our membership. So one day, I was sitting at my desk working, and I got a phone call. Um, I got a phone call from a member, and he told me that he wanted to tell me he received the email and that he wanted to tell me that he's gay. Um, he had not been able to come out to his family. He had not been able to come out at work. But he saw the email and he felt that he could come out to his union and that we created a safe space for him. And so he did not feel alone. And so I invited him to join us at Pride. Um, and that really affirmed our purpose. Mm -hmm. Totally. 
So the coming out process is special and unique to everyone. Tell me about your National Coming Out Day ally campaign and this really incredible 2020 uh, comic strip. Yeah, so actually one of our member over there at the, uh, the worker center, Shannon, wave for us real quick. Um, Shannon is my shop steward at Ralph's and Ventura um, and he designed this comic strip. Um, and we did this last year in 2020 in um, the middle of the pandemic because we couldn't mobilize like we do normally for Pride. Um, Pride every year is a huge opportunity for our union to mobilize our members. We usually had a couple hundred members and their family come out and march with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we've marched with you, mm -hmm. council member. Mm -hmm. um, and we're one of the largest contingent at LA Pride. The reason we do this is because it also gives us a chance to develop leadership with our LGBTQ workers. Um, they start planning this event since January every year. So last year, it came to a screeching halt. We couldn't do that, and we have to pivot and find a different way. So actually, I brought um, to show you, and I think folks could also see that, um, that this little um, postcard thing that we did with the pin inside, oh was our National Coming Out Day campaign where we gave every member, I'm gonna to try to hold up so folks could see at home, this pin to members to wear at the store. Mm -hmm. So that this signal to coworkers, to management, to customers, that we stand for equality in the workplace, mm -hmm. that, that we will not stand for hate. And that created a cultural change. Mm -hmm. So that was our National Coming Out Day events. And you know, we did this under leadership of John Grant because we were also inspired by what happened last year when Supreme Court um, ruled that sexual orientation and uh, gender identity is not something that employer can use to discriminate workers mm -hmm. across the US. Mm -hmm. But people don't know that. Right. So we had to turn um, this historic ruling into something that we could do as an action. That's phenomenal, and that's leadership. And that's your leadership, that's the leadership of your team assembled here. I understand that 95% of coworkers, regardless of orientation or gender identity, wore those pins as allies. That's right. That's how, the ch that's how we change the world. Yes. So the transgender community faces unique challenges in the workplace. Yes. What's the experience like for those union members who are currently transitioning at work? Yes, um, you know, it's extremely difficult um, because as a union member, we fight for good jobs. We fight for a job that has affordable health care, that is trans inclusive. Mm -hmm. We fight for uh, a pension and living wage, and more importantly, job security. And so that's really important for our transgender siblings um, to have this, mm -hmm. but sometimes, it's difficult when folks feel like they're transitioning and facing a lot of um, discrimination at work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were a pioneer even before, um, you know, the Fair Housing and Employment Act require uh, accommodation for transgender workers to be accommodated during their transition. We were pioneer. We have union rep like Tracy Richardson who fought for members who were transitioning to have name tag change. Um, to their names as they were transitioning, to fight for access to bathrooms, something that most people take for granted. Yeah, totally. I mean, the importance of identity, it's who we are. And that cannot nor should be overlooked in this day and age. I came up in the 60s and 70s when none of that was a consideration. So my generation carries with it that, that, that burden where, that was imprinted upon us from a very young age so what you're talking about has special relevance to me and my generation. It's just mm -hmm. so incredible to see. Um, so next question, creating safe spaces causes a culture change at work, mm -hmm. at the workplace. Uh, you've kind of touched upon that a little bit with mm -hmm. the pins and the allies. Uh, can you uh, expand on that a little? Yeah, um, you know, we, we believe that it really start with one person and then bringing it up to scale. Right, it's from self to system, mm -hmm. um, and we do this on a national level. So um, outreach under the um, the leadership of Michelle Kessler, we 
decided that it's really important that we invest in LGBTQ rank and file member leadership. And how do we do this? Well, we had a scholarship. Um, we started a scholarship. It's still ongoing and hopefully we'll resume once the pandemic allows us, well, once we can safely reopen. Um, but this scholarship allows us to bring a small group of rank and file members from across the country to attend the Creating Change conference hosted by the National LGBTQ Task Force. Um, and through this conference, we get to spend quality time with our members, but also we get to expose um, our members to a wide array of social justice issues, mm -hmm. with racial justice being on the forefront of this. We believe mm -hmm. that LGBTQ activists are also racial justice activists, mm -hmm. as well as their economic justice activists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's part of our DNA. Absolutely. I mean, and we learned from some of the struggles going way back, but more recently from the 50s through the 60s, through the black cat, through Stonewall. Yeah. We cut our teeth, our, our, you know, our, our, the ones who came before us, uh, we stand on their shoulders and we cut our teeth through their example. And that's why we have the rights and the platform we have today. We, it was earned by the people who came before us and you're making the most of it and you're taking it to that next step. So this is so exciting. So. This speaks to the work you do beyond the local level. So tell us about the report you worked on with UCLA. Yeah, actually, this is the report. I brought a copy for you. Oh, right on. Um, so we decided um, throughout the pandemic that we have this opportunity to learn more um, about our membership across the United States. So mm -hmm. um, we partner with UCLA Labor Center under um, the leadership of Yana um, Hernandez, uh, Saba, Wahid, and Sid Jordan, mm -hmm. who guide us, our outreach um, board, through this process to launch this study where our board member um, conducted over a thousand surveys mm -hmm. um, with our rank and file members across mm -hmm. the country and conducted interviews. Um, and you know, we found that only 49% of our workforce mm -hmm. were out at work. Mm -hmm. So let that sink in for mm -hmm. a second. Mm -hmm. This is 2020, right, when we did this research. Right. What that means is 49% of our workers don't feel safe at work to come out. Mm -hmm. This opened up for them to be vulnerable to discrimination, to pay discrepancy, to bullying, yeah. to job insecurity. And so we feel like we have a duty to change that. Mm -hmm. It's within our um, power to change that. Mm -hmm. And so we lay out in the report how we're gonna do it. And one of the way is that we want to incorporate um, languages in all of our contracts across the United States and Canada um, to protect LGBTQ workers. But I would even go so far to say that it also means that we need to include LGBTQ and develop LGBTQ workers' leadership um, so that they could help draft and fight for the contract they wish to see. Mm -hmm. You know, that underscores for me that it's entirely possible that that sampling is representative of the rest of the country, mm -hmm. right? So it, it, it kind of makes, it begs to, you know, uh, the question, maybe about half of the LGBTQ plus individuals in the United States don't feel safe to come out either. That's why National Coming Out Day is so important. The work you're doing is so important. This study, I can't wait to dig in. So thank you for providing that to me. I would love to expand on this further with David Quesada and the rest of your outreach committee at your worker center gathered for the first time in person today mm -hmm. since the pandemic started, who are joining us via Zoom. So welcome. And, and David, please tell us about how outreach got in, about how you got involved with outreach and modifying all gender restrooms at your work center. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, so I worked for a company called Lucky's and then got bought out by Albertsons for 25 years. Um, and honestly, I didn't I didn't feel like I had a voice when I was working in the grocery store. And uh, as a matter of fact, I met Gene at one of the rallies and Gene told me that they had this constituency group called Outreach. And I attended one of the meetings and ever since I never stopped going. And I'm actually a union representative now representing members in West Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and Central City. Bravo, bravo for your work, for your courage, 
and for your leadership. Uh, you know, you're bringing change right along with your colleagues there gathered in that room. Um, I'd love to give an opportunity for any of your members to say a few words. And I know you, I know you have things to say, so just <laughs> let's, let's bring it on. Hey yeah. guys, I'm Mary. I'm from Ralph's. Um, and you know, as a grocery worker at Ralph's, it's been a real challenge this year with the pandemic and all the stress and the hardships that have been going on. But every month, I always look forward to meeting with our group on Zoom. It, it just gave me some positivity to look forward to. I'm just so proud to be in this group um, and my fellow low wage, but absolutely essential coworkers here. And you know, I'm glad that we're being recognized for the valuable contributions to our communities. Mm -hmm. To all my uh, fellow LGBTQ plus uh, members out there, I see you and our group is here for you. That's wonderful. And it's in my thinking, it's, it's the, the minimal, the, the, the least we can do. So we stand with all of you and I, uh, UFCW for your incredible selflessness before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and it's gonna continue after. So uh, I wanna thank everyone at the Workers Center and I can't wait to see you at Pride in person next year. Um, I know the planning for this will start in January of 22, but it's gonna be one for the ages next year. And the Pride event is changing and coming into the modern era as well. And it's gonna be in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, the city where Pride was born in 1970 the first one that was officially permitted in the entire United States. So we're coming back to our roots. Uh, now, unfortunately, I do have to share a heartbreaking story. And really, it's a privilege to share this story that illustrates just how deeply COVID affected the family at UFCW. During the pandemic, one of the union's members succumbed to the virus, Cruz Garrido Ocampo. We want to take a moment now to share with you a tribute to Cruz, who was a beloved and special person and lives in the hearts of many. So let's please play the video. I'm from Portugal, which is on the other side of the planet. We met for the very first time in um, 1990, maybe 30 years ago on the same boat where once upon a time there was a, an American TV show, The Love Boat. We met on the same boat, Pacific Princess. We lived together for 30 years, and he is the partner, left me an empty, an empty space in my, in my life. Cruz was a hard worker, but you know, was very kind, was very full of attention. It was his way, you know, was very, very careful, very, you know, attentive. Well, yeah, eventually it was, I mean, as I've had in a poultry production, I mean, uh, area. So eventually um, I was witness of uh, when, he's, when he got, I mean, some kind of issues going on in there. When he became part of a, of a union. So, I mean, it worked out pretty good. I mean, in, in order to all of, all of the, you know, his co-workers have been a better place to work. Became after that, I mean, a uh, union steward. I mean, a, a union representative on the on the on the Palisades Ranch uh, plant. He was as well harassed by his I mean uh, sexual orientation at the beginning, special for that that supervisor, which I I heard that she's no longer there. But people you got to know him by uh, his kindness, his way of being uh, positive, being I mean uh, active at all times. And when they realized that he was fighting for, for a cause, not his cause himself, but everyone's cause, I drank twice already in my room. Sorry. <laughs> it really hurts. But I mean, it's like I dreamed that he was by my side. I dreamed that we were back in Mexico. We use mama. It was nice, so beautiful, no? We had dreams together. And that's why I mean I try. I uh, recently had I mean joined I mean the union that he was to work for. Uh, in order to keep his legacy, 
to the end. I talk to him every day, you know, because I know he's not gone. He's still here. He'll always be here. Like, it's hard for me. I don't want to talk about it because it really hurts my heart so bad. Like I said, I will follow his legacy. But once again, Cruz is not gone. Kirill is still here. He's not gone. He's still here. Still in my mind. Still in my eyes. Still in my heart. He'll always be there. Always. Wow. Um, I want to thank Nikki Garrido for sharing this story and having the courage to just lay it out there and express his emotions on the loss of his beloved Cruz. Very, very sad. And people need to know this story and realize the sacrifices that went on while no one else was looking. We, you know, we lost loved ones. Most everyone knows someone who did not survive COVID. Um, so we offer our deepest synth sympathies and our sincere uh, condolences to you, Nikki, to the entire UFCW family. Um, and through this testimony, Cruz will live on in all of us. So thank you for sharing that. The pandemic changed so many lives, but the tight-knit community of outreach at UFCW is obviously filled with love. That's what the LGBTQ community brings. That's how we do it. Compassion and strength. And as we continue to fight for equity and seek a brighter tomorrow, today I want to present to outreach this com uh, commendation. And so thank you. Just thank you, David. Um, and if you all can see this, um, this basically says in a lot of words, you are all heroes and very deserving of being an honoree for this kickoff of LGBTQ Heritage Month this year in 2021. And so with that, Jean, I would like you to say a few words. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of our outreach family that we feel empowered and witnessed for all that we've gone through. Mm -hmm. And for all the frontline low wage workers, especially out there, we appreciate what you have done fighting for hazard pay and many other measures. Um, for this moment, I mm -hmm. really want to acknowledge all the elders, all the pioneers, all the mm -hmm. activists that have come before us like Cruz, mm -hmm. like Rigo, who um, has set this path for us so that we could continue to do our work. I mm -hmm. believe in healing justice, mm -hmm. and I think that we will get there mm -hmm. because of people like us. Yeah. And so just to end with the word of Mother Jones, we'll mourn the dead, but we'll fight for the living. Mm -hmm. Well said, Jean, and members of Outreach, um, I wanna thank you all for joining us today. It's great to sit here in the same room, the same space with Eugene. We're both fully vaccinated. That's why we're able to do this. Yes. Uh, and so please don't forget to join us in June as we honor our remaining LGBT Heritage Month honorees. On June 10th, we'll honor black LGBTQ plus activists for change. You all are aware of the mural that we put on Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, and on June 24th, we will honor Snehal Desai and East West players right here on channel 35. As we close out today's event, we'll hear from other city leaders uh, who join us in celebrating pride. But first, we'll conclude this live segment with a lovely sideshow of the wonderful members of Outreach at UFCW Local 770. So let's close with the videos and just say, Happy Pride, Los Angeles. Happy Pride.
it's always a great personal honor for me to participate in the city of LA's LGBTQ Heritage Month. And this year, like everything else, it's different. But it is so meaningful and so important that we're together. Hi, I'm Mike Fewer, the Los Angeles City Attorney. I'm very proud to be an ally of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer question and questioning community. Uh, from my time in the State Assembly representing Hollywood and West Hollywood, writing laws to advance equality on taxes, health care, and retirement benefits for same-sex couples, to my current role as city attorney, standing up for victims of hate crimes, and leading the nation and filing briefs with the U.S. Supreme Court to defend the LGBTQ members of our workplace, to assure protections under Title VII, take a stand against discrimination in the Colorado Baker case, and, of course, to support marriage equality in 2015, because being able to marry whom you love is a fundamental civil right. And the city of Los Angeles needs to be always in the forefront of epic battles like that. This year, the theme for LGBTQ Heritage Month in the city is frontline advocacy, honoring those who are working tirelessly during the pandemic. I'm very pleased today to be joined by Oscar De La O, who serves as Vice President of Vienna Star Human Services. I'm very proud to be able to honor, Oscar, your organization's crucial community work. Welcome, Oscar. Could you please tell us a little bit about Vienna Star? Sure, good afternoon, and thank you very much for including us in the LA community as you celebrate LGBT. Um, Vienna Star started 32 years ago to address a specific issue around HIV. Since that time, we have expanded our services to include mental health and substance abuse, outpatient treatment, and most recently, a health clinic. But always with the focus of removing barriers that our community encounters that are the products of poor health outcomes. So for us, it's the empowerment of the individual and advocating on their behalf. Is there anything else, Oscar, about Vienna Star that you'd like to add? Anything particularly important for our audience? I think uh, having been part of Vienna Star for the last 32 years, I can say, that it's a very unique organization because we serve a community that's vulnerable, that has a lot of resiliency within them. They want to improve their lives. They want to help their families and be good um, civic-minded individuals. But they encounter so many issues, but it is a joy and a privilege to be here at Vienna Star. That's very well said, Oscar. Oscar, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. your service to our communities. You are uniquely situated because you are serving particularly vulnerable members of our community at an extremely challenging time. And all of us in the city attorney's office are really pleased to be able to salute Vienna Star Human Services during this LGBTQ Heritage Month. And, and now I'm very excited to uh, toss this to some of my City Hall colleagues, hand this off to them for their introductions of their community honorees for LGBTQ Heritage Month. Again, I'm Mike Fewer, the Los Angeles City Attorney. Thanks for watching. Hi there, welcome to Auntie Melly's house at EPAIT in Council District Number One. Come on in. Please join us. Come on in. Okay, so here at uh, Timeli's house, we have five bedrooms. Um, we can we can accommodate up to sixteen clients at a time. Uh, currently, at the moment, we have twelve. We have one one uh, bedroom down here on the first floor, and we have a few more upstairs. So 
Yeah, I can give you a quick uh, tour if you'd like. And what is your population? Uh, population, we serve, uh, the clients that we serve are, are uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, underserved communities, uh, um, communities of, uh, of, of color, um, basically uh, underserved communities, specifically with that LGBTQ+. Uh, plus. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've done around uh, responding to COVID? So, year. yeah, so we opened in October, right when it was all happening with, with COVID. Um, we've been, I mean, we've, we've basically been taking clients that, that are um, basically homeless. Um, we we make sure that clients before they come in are, are tested. Uh, I believe we have not had, the, the whole time we've been open here, we have not had a, a client that's tested positive. For COVID, and we—that's something that we we still do to this day. We test regularly, um, but basically, you know, we house, make sure that that clients are, are housed, secure, in safe space. Hello, my name is Marcus Mendez, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker here at APAIT. Um, here at Auntie Mally's House, uh, we provide a comprehensive wraparound services that include psychotherapy counseling, case management, medication support. Uh, from a psychiatrist, uh, rehabilitation services, substance abuse services, and linkage to all the ne needed resources that our homeless LGBTQI two-spirited uh, community is in need of. Um, out of the 16 clients that we have here at uh, Auntie Mally's house, we have successfully linked uh, about approximately four clients uh, to uh, permanent housing um, and it is due to the hard work that our case managers and therapists have provided to our clientele. I am Joey Candelario, Division Director of APAIT. We aim to positively impact the quality of life for people experiencing mental health issues, housing insecurity, and at risk for HIV AIDS. APIT is proud to open Auntie Mally's house under City Council District 1 during the peak of the pandemic in October 2020. And we did this to address the increasing homelessness crisis here in our great city of Los Angeles, specifically targeting the LGBTQI2 spirit community. We are proud that since we opened, we have not had any COVID positive cases, and that is thanks to the tes a testament to the work that my colleagues do. APAIT is really proud to be in partnership with City Council District 1 uh, in opening Auntie Mally's house. We opened Auntie Mally's house in the middle of the pandemic in October of 2020, and really doing it so to address homelessness within the LGBTQI2 spirit community who were not only battling homelessness, but also the threat of the pandemic. We're very proud of the fact that we've not had any COVID positive in our house. And that's a testament to the work of APAIT and our colleagues. APIT aims to positively impact the quality of life of people who are experiencing mental health, housing insecurity, and at risk for HIV and AIDS.